Welcome, welcome. Hey, I just want to say it's good to have all of you here today. So glad that we get to join together and uh, experience this and come out and be in service and all that sort of stuff. So I appreciate you being here. Hopefully we'll see at the end of the message whether you appreciate me being here or not, but that's yet to be determined. <clears throat> okay. I'm not going to be a stand-up comedian anytime soon. So uh, also welcome to those of you watching online from wherever you might be. I'm glad that you're watching this video. I hope that you stay through the whole thing. I hope you watch this entire series that we're in. And I hope more than anything that you experience God's presence and that you grow in your relationship with him. Just like I hope that's the same thing for all of us as well. Oh boy, don't worry. There's where we're supposed to be. Okay, we are in the middle of a series called Christian Politics. Um, we are smack dab in the middle. We've done two weeks. This is week three. There's two weeks to come. If this is your first time here, your first time tuning in online, um, you really need to go back and watch the first two messages that we've done. We put them online so they can be saved for all of history's sake, um, and, and especially in about three years when the election cycle starts up again and all of our blood starts boiling because of what's happening. So just bookmark this series, go back and watch it later. It will do good for all of us. But the reason that we're talking about this, I know it's a controversial issue. I know we don't think we should talk about in church, politics in church. But the reason we're talking about this is because of a shift that I think a lot of us have noticed in culture as it relates to those of us who are Christians. And the shift is this, that politics has been growing in importance more and more and more. And not that that's a bad thing, okay? Politics is important. We need to be involved in politics. We need to be vocal in politics. All Americans across the board should be involved in the political process. That is an absolute privilege and right and freedom that we have. We should not take for granted. But what's happened for Christians is as politics has grown, what's happened now is it's eventually overtaken our Christianity. Politics has become the more foundational issue for a lot of Christians. And because politics is more foundational, when we're forced to choose between one or the other, we stick with our political beliefs, and then we try and reshape our Christianity to fit and line up with our politics. And I just think that's the opposite of what God wants us to do. I think instead God would rather have us shape our politics through the lens of our Christianity. What does God say? What does the Bible say? What do we read in the New Testament? How does my relationship with God affect all areas of my life, including how we approach politics? So that's, that's the heart of this whole series. Now, if you were here last week or if you watched the message online last week, you will remember that I said last week was just the first part of a two-part message series. So I am glad that you came back. Way to go, especially if you were ticked at me after last week. Awesome. Don't worry, I'll offend the rest of you today. <clears throat> Here's what we talked about last week. This was, this was the big idea. Submit. That God's will, for those of us who are Christians, God's will is that we would submit to authority above us. And this is applicable in the home. This is applicable in the workplace. This is applicable in the church. And it is certainly applicable in politics. Unless a political authority, a governor, a president, a mayor, whatever— Unless they are commanding us to sin, hey, you must murder somebody, you must steal, whatever it is, short of that, God's will, very, very clear, is that we would submit to authority. And that is so hard, that is so challenging, we will disagree often with political authority above us, but submission only counts when we disagree, okay? Otherwise, it's just called agreeing. Submission only counts when we disagree. And it is very clear throughout the Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus' words to us, Paul's words to us, that God's desire for those of us who are Christians is that we would submit to authority above us. But, like I said last week, that's only half the story. <clears throat> so what's the rest? Well, I think one of the big issues that all people have regarding submission, all people, including those of us who are Christians, one of the big issues with submission or even the idea of submission is that it feels like giving up, right? This would mean yes, okay? It feels like giving up, and especially when it comes to politics. Man, submission just feels like I got to wave the white flag. And, and we tend to have such a fatalistic outlook on life. Like, we think if I have to submit, that means the world's ending and I can't do anything and things are just going to, like, we just, we, we swing the pendulum way to the other way when we, we're told we're supposed to submit. And I think maybe if you were angry last week or you're frustrated, you watch online, you don't even like talking about submission. I think one of the reasons is because maybe what we hear when we talk about submit, maybe what we hear is, 
well, Christians are just supposed to sit down and shut up, right? No, not right at all. That's not what submission means. That's not the heart behind it. But if that's what we hear, if that's what we interpret we're being told, then there's obviously some natural pushback to that, right? There's obviously questions that we have with, well, wait, what about this? And what about this decision? And then that's, that's wrong. That's not right. I believe this is right. And can't we see the way the country is going? We, we start to get all worked up. We have all these what-if questions that we want to say and ask in relation to this submit sort of idea. And I think for those of us who are Christians, it's just good for us every once in a while to take a breather, to take a break, to remember that we are not the first generation that has to deal with a culture that is running the opposite direction of God. Okay? This is not a unique situation that we are in. In fact, Paul writes to his younger friend, younger protege, Timothy, about this sort of thing. He says this, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, heads up, there's going to be very difficult times, okay? Don't let this come as a shock to you. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred He goes on to say they will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends. They will be reckless. They will be puffed up with pride. And they will love pleasure rather than God. And I just think, man, I can't believe the Bible is so irrelevant to our life and our culture, right? I don't know if Paul had a crystal ball or what, but it's almost like when he was writing these words, he, he just spent five minutes in 2021 and watched the news or scrolled through social media and just literally wrote down what he saw. Like, this is our culture, right? We're all aware, no matter where we stand on political issues, religious issues, anything like that, we can all see this. This is where our culture is, and our culture is only going further and further down this road day after day. And so, yes, as Christians... Part of our responsibility from God is to submit to authority. But what do we do about this, right? I even had some people come up to me after last week and say, okay, I hear what you're saying. I got lots of questions. I'm going to wait for next week if that was you. Thank you, by the way. But what do we do with this? What do we do when we see that there are politicians and policies and programs uplifting and defending and celebrating sin? What do we do when we see culture being as anti-God as it can possibly be? What do we do when we see people headed for destruction, pursuing the wrong things, full of pride and, and cruel and hatred? Like, what do we do? We can't just stay silent. And that's why I said this is really a two part message. Because on one hand, we do have a call, a responsibility to submit to authority. But on the other hand, we also have a responsibility to do this, to stand up and to stand up for truth in our world. We are, as Christians, those of us who are Christians, if, if, you're, if you're not a Christian, if you're watching online and you're not a Christian, this whole series is just candy for you. You get to watch from the outside and judge those of us who are Christians. But those of us who are Christians, we are ambassadors for God. We're ambassadors for the good news, not only about Jesus Christ, but all of God's message. In a different letter, Paul writes that we are messengers for God. We have been entrusted with his message, his entire message about his values and his principles and his morals and his perspective on this world. And, and, and yes, we have a responsibility to submit to authority, but we also have a responsibility to stand up for biblical, godly truth in this world. And Christian politics involves both. It's not just one and it's not the other. It's both. There is never a good reason short of sin to not submit, and there is never a good reason to not stand up for God's truth in this world. Now, I'm not even going to dive into topics like masks and small government versus big government and all that sort of stuff. I tend to believe those issues and issues like that are, are more morally neutral than anything else. And you know what? As long as those of us who are Christians, as long as we remember what we've talked about the first two weeks, our purpose to be salt and light, to draw others to God, as long as we remember to submit to authorities up until sin, I think as Americans, we have a lot of freedoms and options to deal with those kind of amoral or neutral issues in our world today. We can stand up or sit down based on our own convictions, handle it from there. But what about political issues that are not morally neutral? What do we do there? Because I think the majority of politics is actually incredibly moral in nature. 
Let me just give you a, a list of some hot political topics right now. Homosexuality, transgender issues, redefining marriage, abortion, racism, social programs, the rich versus the poor. And I know what's happening inside a lot of us right now is we're getting real anxious. We're thinking, oh, don't, don't touch that. Don't, don't go there. Like, you be careful. Don't step on toes. Don't, like, we don't want to touch a hot button. Some of us are thinking right now, there's no way in the world I'm sharing this message on Facebook. Okay, like, you don't even know what we're going to say, but you've already, you've already told yourself, I ain't sharing that one. So, like, but here's the thing. We think we're not supposed to talk about this stuff, but listen, all of these and others were God issues way before they were ever political issues. And we've been misled to say, stay away from this stuff. Don't talk about this stuff. No, that's not right. Now, I do want to say this just because I know the culture that we live in. I don't know where you live watching online, but I want to say if any of these things um, are, are defining characteristics in your life, I would say especially these first two. I want to say this. God loves you. You can put your faith in Jesus. You can go to heaven when you die. There, can, there doesn't have to be anything that separates you and God anymore once you put your trust in Jesus. God loves you regardless of what your lifestyle looks like. And I want to say that here at this church, we love you too. We care about you. We want the best for you. We are never going to be a church that holds up some measuring stick and you have to be at least this tall. To, you have to have at least this little sin to enter the, no, 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 not at all. We are all sinners we are all imperfect. We've all got our own issues. We are all able to know God through Jesus Christ, and we are all able to pursue a growing relationship with God through Jesus Christ, no matter what issues there are, okay? So just, okay, that's the disclaimer. But, however, I have to say this. God is very clear on the issue of homosexuality. Very clear. God is very clear on the issues of marriage and abortion, 100%. And this may come as a shock to some of us, especially if we figure out and understand what God's instructions are, but he's also very clear about social programs and racism and rich versus the poor and what it means to help people and what it means to give assistance. And let me tell you, it is not just handing out more money. God is very clear on these issues, and it is part of our responsibility as followers of God, as people who have been connected to an, into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, it is part of our responsibility to be vocal and be proactive in defining and defending and steering our culture, including through our politics. Later on in 2 Timothy, after Paul writes about last days is how culture is going to look, he goes on to encourage Timothy. He says, hey, don't fall away from the truth. Don't forget what you've been taught. Don't back down. And then he says this right here. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. Part of our responsibility as it relates to Christian politics and even just Christianity in general, part of our responsibility is to stand up for truth. All of God's instructions, all of his will, all of his principles, all of his morality, all of scripture, the Bible is the ultimate source of faith and life and morality in this world. And what God says is best and it is true and it is absolutely right all the time. And we have a responsibility to stand up for that truth. Jesus said that those of us who are Christians, we are salt Okay, salt is used for flavor, yes, to attract, but it is also used as a preservative to uphold truth. Jesus said that we are light, and light certainly can direct people towards God, but light also illuminates darkness wherever it is found. That is part of our responsibility as Christians, is to stand up for God's truth, his principles, his morals, his value, a biblical worldview in our culture today. So why don't we do this? Why not? I mean, way on one side of the spectrum, there are, there are plenty of Christians that have an incredibly hard time submitting to authority. But way on the other side, there are plenty of Christians and maybe even a lot of us here today who have a hard time standing up for the truth. And our instructions from God, God's heart for us to, to stand up for truth is just as compelling and just as challenging as our instruction to submit to authority. Why don't we do this? 
And as I've looked around our culture, and even as I've looked at myself and tried to, tried to see, man, why don't I do this enough? I really think there's two big reasons. Now, maybe these are not the only things, but I, I believe these are probably the two biggest reasons why we don't stand up for what God says in our world today. And the first one is this. I just think we're too afraid. Right? In today's cancel culture world, fear is a very real factor. We often find ourselves afraid to speak up and to stand up on matters of morality, especially when they become political topics. And listen, the days of agreeing to disagree are gone in our culture today. The days of politely sharing differing opinions and still remaining friends seems to be all but gone. Tolerance has become like the new, the highest value in our culture today. And tolerant doesn't mean tolerant anymore. Tolerant means you have to affirm and celebrate and praise anything I do. And if you don't, you are intolerant. And even though tolerance seems to be the highest value, people who claim to be tolerant oftentimes are the most intolerant. We all know about the online woke movement and the woke mob and how quickly any of us can be canceled and livelihoods shut down and businesses shut down. Man, if you said something when you were 13, by golly, you're a racist and like, oh my gosh, fear is a very real thing that Christians have to deal with when it comes to standing up for truth in our world today. But I don't think that's how it's supposed to be. Never once has God called Christians to live in fear. The command throughout all of Scripture is fear not, fear not, fear not. The early church understood this so well. The early church faced consequences for sharing truth that are way more than you and I can even imagine. The potential danger that they face, and often not the potential, but the actual danger they face, was far more than we will ever experience in our lives. And yet never once did they back down. Never once did they not speak the truth about what God said. And as Christians, we shouldn't be afraid to do the same either. We shouldn't be afraid to speak the truth about homosexuality. It's hard but we shouldn't be afraid to. We shouldn't be afraid to speak the truth about gender and marriage. We shouldn't be afraid to advocate for the rights of all human life, including the unborn. That's part of our responsibility. If we don't speak up, who's gonna? Who's going to speak on behalf of God's? And oftentimes, we are just simply too afraid to be bold. The answer to being afraid is being more bold. But this is not the only issue. There's another one, and I think this one is maybe even worse. It's apathy. Apathy means we don't care. We, we don't even, it doesn't even bother us. And I think when I look at Christianity in America, I think apathy is a far more destructive force than fear is. Because I think most Christians in America, when I look around, most Christians in America are not concerned at all with the fact that godly morals and values are degrading at an alarming rate. In fact, most Christians in America don't even care that their neighbors and family members and coworkers are going to hell, but that's a message for another day. But as it relates to standing up for God's truth, Christians in America don't seem to be concerned or care at all with defending and protecting those truths. Because Christian values, what God says, his wisdom, his, his instructions for life have produced some of the best societies, best living conditions, freest cultures, most opportunities for people to thrive and grow and fulfill their dreams and pursue life, liberty, and happiness. And we just don't seem to give any sort of care about whether that goes away or not. Who cares if we redefine marriage under the banner of love? As long as I can do what I want and go to my cabin, let's, let somebody else deal with that. That's not my problem. It doesn't affect me, we think. Who cares about really def accurately defining racism? Eh, that doesn't, just let me watch the NFL. As long as I can watch the NFL, I don't care what they do or say or put on their helmets or try and shove down our throats during the commercials. Just let me watch the NFL and go to the games. When it comes to things like creating a, an, an assistance, a welfare, a social system, we don't care that it doesn't line up with biblical values. We just think as long as I can do what I want, when I want, how I want, man, let somebody else deal with that. And we are so apathetic towards our culture. But just like fear is not what God has called us to, God has not called Christians to apathy either. Paul wrote in his letters often that, that he was heartbroken for people who are far from God. 
He, would, he, he, he shed tears for people who didn't experience a relationship with God and not only know him, but know his truth and live out his relationship with them. Jesus, it's recorded that when he looked out over the crowds, he had compassion because people were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And the cure to apathy is allowing God to break our hearts. When was the last time your heart was broken because somebody you know, or even just somebody in general, struggled with homosexuality or transgenderism? Even if they don't know it's a struggle yet, does our heart break for them? When was the last time your heart broke for a woman who had an abortion? When was the last time our hearts broke that that we are perpetuating a system that keeps people down and keeps people locked into a victim mentality? God has not called us to apathy either. And I think these are the two biggest reasons why Christians don't do this. Why we don't stand up for what God has called us to do. And really both of those reasons, if, if we're honest with ourselves, being afraid and being apathetic, Both of them are just a veil for selfishness. We are too afraid to speak the truth because we are afraid of what people might say about me. My reputation, my business, my livelihood. So I'm just going to stay silent. No. The reason we're apathetic is just selfishness. I care more about me than I care about you. And neither one of those is a good reason. Just like there is no good reason to not submit to authority except sin, just like there's no good reason for that, there is no good reason in the world for Christians to stay silent on moral issues, especially in our politics. And listen, that's all good information, right? Cool, good theory, glad we talked about it. But what about when the rubber meets the road? What are you going to do when you and I, when we run into people and we have an opportunity to stand up for truth? How do we do that? How do we as Christians, those of us who are, how do we stand up for God's truth in our world? How do we stand up against politicians and policies and special interest groups that are promoting anti-God values? How do we stand up in our relationships with other people, people that we know and do life with and care about? How do we do this? And especially, how do we do this in light of our mission? Isn't that the big question? How do we do this? Listen, I want to start with a a large-scale application of this, okay? This is not necessarily in personal relationships, but on a large-scale I think that one of the best ways we can stand up for God's truth in this world is by how we vote. Now, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I believe that the privilege and freedom and right that we've been afforded in this country because of the Constitution, the ability to vote is an incredibly powerful way for Christians to stand up for truth in our world. But what's happened over the last few election cycles is Christians have been sucked into the same game that the rest of culture plays. And that game is, poli- is personality politics. Christians have become more focused on a candidate's personality and less about voting our values. Now, before you jump ahead, I am not endorsing or cutting down any candidate, okay? The biggest thing with Obama was his personality and the biggest thing with Trump was his personality. And we have boiled down, we have watered down voting into just voting based on whose personality we like more. And listen, I don't think that's the proper way that we fulfill what God wants us to do in our voting. I don't even think, this is just my opinion, but I don't even think it's wise that we vote based on the person because every human being has flaws. Every human being has issues. Every human being is a sinner. There is never going to be, there never has been a perfect political candidate for any political office. So what if instead of playing personality politics, what if instead we made our votes based on platforms? Which platform more aligns with my beliefs? Which which political party more lines up with godly morality in the world? Which side of the aisle, or even if you wanted to get into other parties, which one is going to advocate more for godly morality and which one is going to advocate for anti-God morality? And again, there's no perfect option, okay? Just be aware of that. You're never going to find a perfect one. But which one is going to do more? Which one is going to line up more with this? And I think what's happened over the last 
few election cycles, not just this last one, is that Christians have voted based on someone's personality. And what can end up happening is we end up working against the mission that God has called us to because we've become focused on the wrong things. Part of the way, large-scale application that we stand up for truth is through how we vote. And I believe God would have us vote with this in mind because who else is going to do this in the world? Who else's vote is going to line up with this? But that's large scale. That's not where most of us live our day-to-day life, is it? A lot of times when we're presented with opportunities to stand up for truth, it's in one-on-one relationships. It's in conversations. It's at work. It's neighbors. All those sorts of things. How do we stand up for truth there? I think that's that's really the big question that we have to ask. And luckily for us, we've got instructions. Nobody else seems excited about that. Paul writes this to Timothy. He is a servant of the Lord, a Christian. Must not quarrel, but must be kind to everybody. That goes back to what we talked about the first week of this series. But they must be able to teach and be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. And I think when it comes to standing up for truth in our world today, how we do that in relationships is found in these highlighted words. Now, I just highlighted it myself, but I think this is the answer. And there are some Christians in our world, maybe even some of you here today are watching online, there are some of us who need to focus more on being patient and more on being gentle and being less of a jerk and less offensive. Totally got that. But I think there's far more of us today that we need to focus more on the teach word and the instruct word because we are so hesitant to speak up for truth. We are so hesitant to upset the apple cart. We are so hesitant. We just want to keep the peace. But listen, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus illustrates so perfectly how to do both sides of this in his encounter with a woman caught in the act of adultery. Okay, so here's this woman caught in a blatant sin, right? She's dragged through town. She's thrown in front of Jesus. All of these people come around her and they're, they're yelling insults at her and belittling her and shaming her and she must have just wished she could have died. The, 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 the humiliation must have been so much. But Jesus stands in front of all of them and says, hey, hey, listen, listen. I know everybody else wants to condemn you. I know everybody else thinks you're worthless. I know everybody else thinks just write you off. But I'm not like that. I love you. I care. But I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to judge you like the rest of them. I'm not going to try and stone. No, 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 no. We're going to be different. I'm going to be gentle. I'm going to be patient with you. But Jesus also goes where a lot of us Christians are too afraid or too apathetic to go. And he tells the woman, go and sin no more. What you're doing is not right. What you're doing is not good. And I'm not going to endorse that. Stop doing that. Go and sin no more. And sometimes for us, especially the closer the relationship is that you and I are in, it is so hard to stand up for truth, right? It is so uncomfortable. It is so challenging. We are more concerned with keeping the peace than sharing the truth. But the goal is not peace. The goal is truth. If we just wanted to keep the peace, we would never tell people that the only way to get to God is through Jesus Christ. That is very narrow-minded. That is very offensive. But we say it, we share it in a loving way, in a gentle way, in a respectful way, but we say it and we stand up for that truth. Why? Because truth matters. We have to stand up for truth. And as far as it relates to Christian politics, part of standing up, as uncomfortable as it is, means I have to be bold. I have to call sin, sin. No, I cannot endorse what you're doing. No, I cannot affirm that behavior. No, I cannot go along with the flow. I still love you as a human being. I still respect you as a human being. We don't have to be any different in our relationship, but I want you to know I cannot go with the flow on that. I will not affirm, support, be a part of that. No, that's wrong. Now listen, every situation that you and I face is going to be so unique so challenging, so many complex situations and how conversation goes. We can't possibly talk through everything that you and I might have. I mean, we could spend the next 10 years and still not cover everything. But what I want to do instead this morning is give us a question that we can ask ourselves. 
When we are presented with an opportunity to stand up for truth, let's ask ourselves this. Do I care more about me or do I care more about you? Do I care more about me and my reputation, what you think of me, or do I care more about you? And I I really like to try and think of this question in, in the context of parenting. I think parenting is where we get the best view of this. That for those of us who are parents, we still have little kids at home. Part of our responsibility, what God calls us to do as parents, is to teach and to train and to discipline and to correct and to steer our kids. And often our kids, if we are doing a good job at that, our kids will say things like, well, you wouldn't, you, how could you do this if you really love me? Why would you discipline me if you really love me, right? Haven't we all, I mean, I remember saying that to my parents and my kids have said it to me, or how could you do this? Yeah, you don't really love me if you're gonna discipline me like that. You don't really love me if you're gonna correct me. But as parents, at least good parents, we know, no, 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 no. You may not understand this, children. You may, you may hate me. You may slam the door in my face. You may call me names. You may text your friends about how bad I am. But I'm doing this because I love you. It's because I care about you and your future and how you grow up and what type of person you're going to be. I care more about you, child, than I do what you think of me right now. And I hope someday you see that. But, but that's the sort of attitude we need to have when, there, when we have opportunities to stand up for God's truth in this world. Do I care more about me? Am I afraid for me? Am I just so apathetic and concerned about me? Or do I care about you? Do I care about your life? Do I care about the inevitable struggles that you are going to face down the line if you ignore what God says? Do I care about you like God cares about you? And I think this question is maybe one of the best questions we can ask ourselves to navigate the murky waters of standing up for truth in our world today. At work, at the office, if the issue of abortion or women's rights comes up, are you and I going to be bold enough to stand up for truth? Now, that doesn't mean we have a license to be a jerk. That doesn't mean we'd be some holy roller and just crush people as we condemn them. Not at all. We always be respectful of people. But are we going to stand up or are we going to be silent? If the issue comes up, are we going to be willing to say, I just want you to know, I believe abortion is wrong. I believe that a woman's rights do not supersede the rights of the unborn child that is within her. Actually, I believe so much in all humans' rights that I am willing to take criticism and controversy, whatever you might think about me, because I value human life. Are we willing to stand up for that? Who else is going to if we don't? Again, not rude, not disrespectful, but certainly never silent either. Those of us who are parents with kids in the school system, more and more, you you know this, I don't have to tell you, but more and more anti-God curriculum is entering the classroom every single day. Are we going to be bold enough to stand up for the truth or not? That's part of what God has called us to do. Now, standing up for truth doesn't mean we go into a school board meeting like a Karen. Sorry if your name's Karen. This is not about you personally, but we don't go into a school board meeting like a Karen and start yelling and crying and belittling people and walk out feeling justified. That ain't effective, okay? But are we going to stand up for truth or not? Are we going to be willing to say, I don't believe that second graders should learn about about human sexuality? I don't believe that kids should be encouraged to choose their gender. I don't believe that we should separate kids in classrooms and graduation ceremonies based on the color of someone's skin. That is wrong, and I want you to know I am not going to be a part of that. At school board meetings, at sporting events, in the pickup line with our kids' teachers, are we going to be bold enough to stand up for truth Are we going to care enough, not just about our kids and what we want, but about all kids and the future of the education system in general in our country? Are we going to care enough to stand up? Are we going to be too afraid and apathetic to do anything about it? I think in our our, our close, close relationships, right, with family members, close friends, that sort of thing, this is where it gets the hardest, no doubt. But God doesn't give us a free pass just because it gets hard, (laughs) There's no free pass because submission is hard and there's no free pass because standing up is hard. And I guarantee that some of us here, some of us online, we have family members or close friends right now who are either dating 
or married to somebody of the same gender. What do we do in those situations? I know we love them, obviously. I know we care about them, obviously. I know we don't want to offend them, obviously. But are we going to stand up for truth or not? Can we say things like, listen, I love you, brother. I love you, sister. I love you, child. I love you, friend. I love you so much. I care about you. In fact, it's because I care about you so much. I am compelled to share my Christian beliefs with you. I'm compelled to share God's truth on this matter. Now, you do what you want with that information. You make your own decisions. I'm not trying to legislate how you live, but I'm also not going to give you any sort of inkling that I agree with your lifestyle choices. I can respect you. I can love you. We can still be cordial. We can still engage in family functions. We can still do all of that, but I have to. I'm compelled by God to stand up for truth, and because I believe that what God says is right, because I believe that what God says is true, because I believe that he knows best for the human race and his instructions are always better than what we could do on our own, I have to share with you on this issue. You do what you want, but I have to. I love you too much to not share. And I said last week that for some of us, submitting to authority may be the hardest thing we ever do when it comes to our Christianity But I think there are more of us here today and more of us watching online. There are more of us that standing up for God's truth is going to be the hardest thing we ever do in our Christianity. Because here's what's inevitably going to to happen. It might feel wrong. It might feel unloving. But in fact, it is maybe the most loving thing we can ever do. Love doesn't mean we just go along with whatever, whatever everybody wants, whatever, whatever everybody thinks, and just go along with whatever. We don't do that with people who are addicted to drugs. We don't do that with people who are murderers. We don't do that with people who steal. We don't do that with people who lie. Why would these political issues be any different? Loving somebody, truly loving somebody, means I am willing to take the cost. I am willing to bear the weight. I am willing to take the backlash for your benefit. I'm willing to do that. So yes, I'm going to be gentle. Yes, I'm going to be patient. But Paul says to Timothy, and I believe God would say to us as well, but also teach and instruct. I want to read one more thing this morning, and it's really the why behind all this. Paul finishes up with the why, and it's the same why that we've been talking about throughout this entire series. He says this, perhaps if we do this correctly, if we stand up for truth, Gentle, patient, yes, but teach and instruct and not be silent. Perhaps if we do that, God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Perhaps, just maybe, if those of us who are Christians, if we can learn to be bold, perhaps, just maybe, those of us who are Christians, if we can learn to share God's truth, perhaps, just maybe, For those of us who are connected to God, if we can learn to communicate God's eternal, always right, perfect, absolute truth in our world in the right way, maybe, just maybe, we can accomplish the mission as we do it. Because standing up for truth doesn't need to be avoided, and it doesn't need to be a barrier. In fact, if we can learn to do it the right way, we can actually accomplish the very thing that God has called us to in the first place. Submission and standing up. Christian politics includes both. Let me pray for us before we head out. Father, this this is a tough one. There's no doubt about it. We can't do this on our own, God. We, We know what you say. We know your instructions for us. But Father, right now we're just asking for some help, some super natural help. Because if we try and do this on our own, man, we're going to screw it up. We're going to get in the way and we're either not going to say anything or we're going to say it too harshly. I don't know what it is, but Father, we need your help to stand up for your truth in this world. Father, I pray for, for those of us who are Christians right now. I pray, number one, that you would illuminate your truth to us. Father, if there's an area that we are off or that we don't line up with, 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 with what you say, Father, would you correct us first? Before we go out and start pointing out other things, Father, would you 
touch our hearts and draw us back to your truth for ourselves. But God, that's not where it ends. And I pray, I know every single one of us this week, everybody watching online, we are all going to have opportunities to stand up for you this week. Father, I pray that you would be with us in those times. I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us strength and courage. I pray that your character and your presence, both the loving side, but well, the loving side and all, but both the, the not offend side and also speak up for the true side. May God, may all of your character be evident in and through us. And Father, I pray that we would be able to accomplish what you want to see accomplished in this world. And I pray most of all that as we stand up for your truth, God, I pray that you would use our little part to help fulfill your bigger mission in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.